times to have her with me here on the platform. And uh, I want you to know that she not only prays for you on Sunday, folks, but she prays for you through the week. And uh, she loves you. And I do too. I appreciate each one of you for sure. The message that I have to share with you today, I've entitled, Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith. And, uh, that was my goof, not the man at the soundboard. I want to talk to you today about baptism and about communion. You've seen the communion elements here at the front of the church. We're going to be sharing in communion in just a little while. But uh, it seems that there's so much to understand and appreciate about God's gifts of baptism and communion. This morning I just felt, and through this week, uh, sense that the uh, Spirit was leading me to do a teaching message about these ordinances, or sacraments, as some call them. I want to tell you a little story I heard long ago about two boys. One attended a Catholic church, and the other a Protestant church. And they were kind of curious about the churches that one another attended, so they decided that they would visit the two different churches on alternating weeks. So the first week, the Protestant boy went with the Catholic boy to the service at the Catholic church. And he saw some things that he had not seen in his own congregation. The priest was up there. And he would go through his ritual, and as he would do something, the Protestant boy would kind of turn to his friend and say, what does that mean? And he would respond, I don't know what it means, but it means something. <laughs> and a little later, what does that mean? I don't know what that means either, but it means something. <laughs> well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, but it, it means something. And so it went. Well, the next week they went to the Protestant church. And after the preliminaries and the worship and all the good stuff, uh, the message was given. And the, the sermon got kind of long, at least compared to what the Catholic boy was used to. And uh, as the pastor preached and talked and went on, uh, occasionally he would go like this and check his wristwatch, and then he'd continue to talk some more, and he'd check his wristwatch. And finally the Catholic boy goes like this, and he says, what does that mean? Protestant boy said, he does that every Sunday, but it doesn't mean a thing. Um, today we want to talk about something that does mean something. Baptism and communion. This is kind of a teaching message. It might even be a message where you want to take notes. I've called baptism and communion stepping stones of faith. Now, some of you are new to the church and new to the faith. And uh, this will be helpful to you to understand what baptism and communion mean. Others of you have been believers in Jesus for many, many years and are familiar with these things. But there's still more to learn, and we all need to be reminded. Sometimes baptism and communion are referred to as ordinances. An ordinance is a special event in the life of the church with special meaning for God's people. Baptism and communion are sometimes also called sacraments. A sacrament is where something ordinary is taken and given a sacred meaning. In this case, the ordinary bread and wine take on a sacred significance. Let's talk first of all about Baptism. Baptism is a sacrament indicating that we are beginning a life of faith in Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16 and verse 16, it says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now I want to explain clearly that baptism will not save you. 
It's not baptism that does the saving. It's Jesus that does the saving. I'm going to uh, tell you something that comes from <coughs> a family situation. I wasn't around at the time, obviously, and neither was my wife. But when her father wanted to marry her mother, the family objected because he had not been baptized. They said he, he couldn't marry her, my mother-in-law, until he was baptized. So what did he do? He went ahead and got baptized. The only problem was he wasn't a believer yet and actually didn't become a Jesus follower in the deepest, truest sense of the word until my wife was about 12 years old. And things really changed in their home. So it's not the baptism that does the saving. It's Jesus that does the saving. But baptism is very important. It's important to Jesus. Baptism in water is an outward and visible sign of an inward spiritual new life. A spiritual rebirth by the Holy Spirit of Jesus. If you truly believe, if you receive forgiveness from sin, the Holy Spirit of Jesus comes into your life. When that happens, baptism is something that you want to do at the first opportunity. I want to give you three reasons today why every believer in Jesus should be baptized. I'm talking now about true believers, not just people who say, yes, I believe that there's a God, but people who have placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior from sin and trusted Him not only with their lives, but with their eternal destiny. Before I get to the three reasons for baptism, I want to just comment on the fact that for much of the evangelical church in North America, baptism has become almost an optional thing. <coughs> yeah, it's a good thing if you get around to it. I want to tell you, the Bible does not talk about baptism as an option. It's the first step of faith and obedience. It indicates, I'm all in for Jesus. No turning back. Now, in the Be in Christ Church of Canada, of which we are a part, baptism is done normally by immersion, putting people right under the water and bringing them back out again. Bringing them back out is a really important part. <laughs> um, we do not say that baptism by sprinkling or pouring is invalid. The Bible emphasis is not on the mode of baptism. But it is also significant to know that the word baptize comes from the Greek baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. And there's no doubt that in the early church, baptism was carried out initially by immersion. John the Baptist did his work at the Jordan River in the comments. He did it at a place where there was lots of water. He wanted to be able to get people under the water. And then it talks about Jesus at his baptism coming up out of the water. So obviously he was baptized by immersion. Now some churches baptize infants or young children. When that's done, they believe that the baptism becomes effective when the child places their faith in God in a way that is real and personal. We believe that baptism should follow conversion. In other words, you come to faith in Jesus first. We do dedicate children at our church. But we wait to baptize people until they have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. In some cases, people have been baptized as infants, but now they've come to faith and they're baptized again. We belong to a group of churches that is called Anna Baptist. That's really, again, baptizing is what the word means. It was a case where people who had been baptized as infants came now as believers and wanted to be baptized again, and people gave them the, the term, the name Anabaptists. Now I will say in advance that I have seen many people struggle about whether or not to be baptized. 
It's sometimes a thing that, that seems hard to do. I've seen people struggle about making the decision, but here's what I'll tell you. I've never seen somebody regret that they took that step of faith and obedience. So if you have not been baptized and you are a believer, I encourage you to speak with me and we'll set up an opportunity for you to be baptized in the very near future. Now, I told you I'd give you three reasons why Christians should be baptized. The first one is this. It's following the example of Jesus. If you're taking notes, write down the key word. Example. The example of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, we read, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Bible says that Jesus is our example. He's more than that, but he certainly is our example. And we want to follow his example. If the Father was pleased with Jesus when he was baptized, you can be confident that he will also be pleased with you. The second reason that I'll give you for being baptized, is that it is the clear command of Scripture. Write down the word command. The command of Scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is the experience that uh, people had at Pentecost when the Spirit came in a new and powerful way and Peter preached the message and uh, the people heard it and they were cut to the heart, it says. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, it doesn't say repent and you die. It says repent and be baptized. Every one of you. It's important to God. Repent means to turn around and go in the other direction. You've been moving away from God, following a path of sin. Now you're turning toward God. <clears throat> and baptism is the indication of that turn around. And thirdly, here's the third reason why you should be baptized. To identify with Christ. Write down the word identify. Identify with Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and following, we read this. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism represents what Jesus did for us. Going under the water represents his death and burial. Coming out of the water represents his resurrection. And we identify with that. Now why is it essential that we identify with Christ in his death and resurrection? Since we as humans would not believe and trust God and follow him in perfect loyalty and obedience, Jesus came to do it for us. He couldn't do it from heaven. He had to come to earth and live among us as a human. His whole life from cradle to grave was lived as a perfect human response to God. He represents us. Christ's faith becomes our faith. Christ's obedience becomes our obedience. Christ's baptism becomes our baptism. Christ's death becomes our death. Christ's resurrection becomes our resurrection. And so, when you're baptized, it becomes also a testimony to others that you identify with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. Let's talk now about communion. We call it 
holy community. A sacrament celebrating the life that we have in Jesus. Did you know that the table of the Lord, communion, Eucharist, whatever name you want to give it, was the identifying sign of the early church? We find that they chiseled it into stone, the bread and the cup. They painted it on the walls of their meeting places. Jesus himself gave the Passover meal, the bread and the cup, a new and deeper meaning. According to Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, it says, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When it comes to the bread of communion, the key word to remember is remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This is inscribed on communion tables all over the world. In remembrance of me. This is how Jesus chose to be remembered. <coughs> do this, he said. And his followers, the church, the early church, did it. And the church continues to do it. And when we come to the table of communion, we remember Jesus. We remember his sacrificial death and his victorious resurrection. I tell you, never miss a communion service if you have the opportunity to be there. I found a quotation from a man by the name of Joseph R. Schultz. He said, by the hearing of the ear, the seeing of the eye, the tasting of the mouth, the touching of the fingers, and the feeling of the heart, Man is brought into a spiritual dimension that is not otherwise possible. Communion helps us to express our highest devotion to God in Christ. So that's the bread. What about the wine, the cup? The key word here is covenant. Write down that word, covenant. According to Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. When you take communion, when you drink the cup, you are entering into a covenant with God. This is a pretty solemn thing. It's a pretty significant thing. A covenant is a solemn promise, like a marriage pledge. It's a commitment of permanent intention. We're going to make this thing go on throughout all of life. A covenant is a pledge of loyalty and obedience. You know, we have a covenant-making God. God made covenants with his people down through the centuries. With people like Noah, and Abraham, and David. He made a covenant with his people Israel that he will honor through all of human history and into eternity. And he makes a covenant with all who come by faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. A blood covenant, if you will, is the most sacred of all. Communion comes with a warning. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 and following, it says, Those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick 
and a number of you have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for death. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So we need to come with a sense of reverential awe. We need to recognize that in Holy Communion, we are honoring the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I would say to the parents who are here today, don't serve communion to very small children. It is your responsibility as parents to know and decide when your child is ready to participate in communion. You say, how do I know when my child is ready to, to be taking communion? I would say this, are they ready to be baptized? Have they made a personal commitment of faith to Jesus Christ. Now if you have believed but have not yet been baptized, you may participate. But I would say, do so with the intention to be baptized at the first opportunity. Understand that faith in Jesus involves not only belief, but trust, loyalty, and obedience. When you become a believer, you do not automatically receive divine perfection. None of us are perfect. We all sin too much and love God and His people too little. But we want to do better. Isn't it good that when Jesus, by His Spirit, comes into our lives, we don't receive divine perfection, but we receive what I'll call divine infection. We become infused by His Holy Spirit. It's a good disease. It's the responsibility of this church and each church member to infect the world with divine life and love. Jesus wants us to be contagious Christians. If you are not infecting others, you need to ask yourself if you really have the disease. Or maybe you're just not getting close enough to people to spread it. When we receive the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion, we receive assurance. Assurance of our relationship with Him. Parents, when your child holds your hand for reassurance, are they relying on their weak grip or on your strong grip? The answer is, they're relying on your strong grip. In baptism and communion, we put our hand in God's strong hand. And we rely on Him to hold on to us. Life is wild, but God is good. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would impress on us today the significance of both baptism and communion. Thank you that you have given us these sacraments as ways to connect more closely with you. These are stepping stones of faith to help us on our spiritual journey. You're so good to us, God. You change us and give us new life when we believe in you. But you give us these tangible things to reinforce our spiritual commitment. Today, God, I pray that you would fill us with love for you. 
Fill us with love for you because you loved us first. And because you loved, you gave. You gave your one and only Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We come now to the table of communion. And as we do so, we want to give full honor and glory to the one who died for us and rose again. We remember Jesus and we covenant with him to be his people by his grace. This time I'll call those who are assisting in the service of the union to come and join me here at the table. We've already heard how on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, distributed it, and said, do this in remembrance of me. As we pass the bread, we ask that you would just take it. Uh, we're using the Jewish matzah, probably very similar to what they would have used back in the day. Hold it in order that we may eat together. If you're a believer in Jesus, we welcome you to his table. It's not the table of the Delisle Community Chapel. It's the table of our Lord. We eat together in remembrance of Jesus. Amen. Passover supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, distributed it, and said, this cup is the new covenant in my life. As we drink the cup today, let's make it an expression of our commitment to the covenant 
that Jesus has made with us. As the cup is passed, we ask that you would hold it, take one and hold it in order that we may drink. Drink together the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood. <coughs> Amen. We ask that you would remain in an attitude of reverence as we pass the trays one more time and collect the cups. This is a great opportunity to. Uh, just be in prayer, letting Jesus know that you want to be all in for him. No 